This is Lecture 7, Principles of Ecology. Self-sustaining mechanisms in ecosystems, or the battle for biodiversity. A couple of notes while we are getting started here. First of all, this is the last lecture in Unit 2. It means after you've taken the, unit, the uh, Lecture 7 quiz, is available now. Give them start writing my finger. This is almost illegible. Taking the quiz, the unit to test is available and it's next. So please pay attention to that. Look at the water hyacinth, Acornia crisapes, if you're into the Latin terms. So it looks like a very beautiful little flower there. It, it's just got this, this gorgeous. I don't know, a bouquet to it. It's kind of a purple thing. However, it was introduced in Florida in 1884 as an ornamental plant. As with many wonderful things, it's a quite lovely. <laughs> Accidentally, it made it into a river, the St. John's River. Soon, it took advantage of its remarkable ability to reproduce. Ten plants can grow to 600,000 plants in eight months. And there were no natural predators in Florida. So, it took over. Uh, it once covered more than 120,000 acres of lakes in Florida, lakes and rivers. Uh, caused some, some serious economic damage because you couldn't even get on these lakes and rivers. We, the state of Florida, spends more than $2 million every year to control it. And the term is maintenance control. Maintenance. We're not going to get rid of it. It's just maintaining it, just staying up with where we are. So this is what we're talking about in this particular lecture. The idea of homeostasis, maintaining balance and exploring biodiversity. Balance. Natural systems have population controlling factors. We'll talk about what populations are and how they're controlled. The term resilience. Resilience is the ability to recover from some sort of an impact. And ecosystems often do have, often can be resilient. If they lose their resilience, then there are some problems that crop up. Species diversity and stability, define diversity actually. Natural succession, how life is established in terrestrial systems, kind of two primary ways, two ways. Primary succession is from rock, bare rock. And secondary succession is from soil. So we have rock and we have soil. Changes during succession, what sort of things change, what takes place over the course of time. Evolution, the source of the Earth's biodiversity responding to changing conditions through natural selection, genetic variation, and speciation. There's also the term coevolution, where two species adapt and change together. And finally, a brief bit, because there's a lot more coming in the future, next few units, on human impacts on ecosystems. And try to throw, I always throw some current events in here, of course. By the time you're reading, listening to this video, it may not be that uh, current, but we'll try to keep it current. Homeostasis. Remember our thermostat. This is an example of a negative feedback loop. You may see that on the test, so you might want to remember that. From the term homeo meaning same, and stasis means standing, literally staying the same, staying in the same place. We have elaborate systems in our bodies that maintain our internal homeostasis. Your temperature stays pretty much the same all the time. Blood sugar levels, almost regardless of what you eat, but we'll get to that in a second. Your heart rate, although it can't increase and decrease, there are systems for maintaining it, getting it right back down or up as it needs to be. Water content, you usually have to drink more water in that case, but we try to maintain that. Hormone levels, etc. If any of these, or a myriad of other things in our bodies that we regulate, we don't consciously regulate most of them, they're just happening inside our bodies. If they get out of balance, we can become ill rather quickly. That's not to say that our vital signs don't change over the course of a day. So, say you, you, you like that candy bar. You're healthy. 
you eat that candy bar, blood sugar levels jump up, of course, immediately afterwards, but then they recover using the body's own balancing system. Well, ecosystems are the same way. It's a beautiful picture of a tropical rainforest. Ecosystems have the same checks and balances, these negative feedback loops. Change does happen, and ecosystems have to respond to that change. They're not static. They don't stay the same all the time. When you look at, say, a, well, a, a coral reef, relatively simple ideas in, in tropical systems, not so much. You have water hyacinths. Other invasive exotics, in this case we talked about the uh, lionfish in uh, tropical systems that have basically done a lot of damage in tropical systems. Of course, now we're using the lionfish for food, for us, actually. Invasive exotics can throw ecosystems out of this homeostasis. So, an example from, well, I guess this is the upper Midwest. Snowshoe hares and their predators. The snowshoe hare is predated on, predated on, whatever it is, eaten by the lynx. Lynx canadensis. So Americans get eaten by the Canadians. Oh, that's not right. Anyway, there are extensive trapping records for snowshoe hares and actually lynx too. Uh, the researcher Elton proposed that abundance cycles were driven by variations in solar radiation. Well, that's a part of it. But, well, later view of things, Keith in 1983 suggest overpopulation theories that really disease and parasitism make a big difference in terms of how populations are controlled. There's physiological stress. When you get to high enough densities, perhaps those organisms don't do nearly as well. And then there's starvation due to reduced food. All those things can happen. Um, in the absence of, let's say, a nice cycle like this one. So population fluctuations, it's that classic cycle starting in 1850. Well, I actually start earlier than that. This graph only goes, and no, it's a fairly short range graph. It only goes to 1930. Of course, we're still keeping these records. But the links and, shows, links and snowshoe hare populations show this long-term cycle. The hare is this red bar up here, red line. Lynx is the blue line. You can see that as the hair, the, uh, hair population increases, eventually the lynx population increases to follow it. Then the hair population drops and the lynx population drops. You get the idea here. The hair population jumps up way high and the lynx population follows, but then it drops after the hair population drops. It's an impressive record. Population cycles. Basically, we look at the role that predation may play in producing these population cycles. A lot of other animal species show these things. So some cycles of abundance. Over many years, the prey, the, uh, sorry, <laughs> the snowshoe hare, the blank there, and the predators, the lynx, you know, they should have said snowshoe hare is Americanist, but they didn't do that, so that's what I get, seem to balance one another. But it's clear the populations change from one season to the next. Long-term view shows that abundant cycles are driven by, honestly, that variation in solar radiation was a true statement. Decimation by de disease and parasitism. So that's going to come and go through. It's not just the lynx controlling the snowshoe hare. There's also, when you get high enough densities, the snowshoe hare doesn't do very well. Reduce food from starvation. Those ecosystems in homeostasis remain pretty much the same over the long term, but their populations change. The number of organisms in a particular population change. The makeup of the, the uh, populations will change. The communities will change. So we'll talk about that in a second. So, ecological systems. Very dynamic. Interdependent plants and animals in a particular environment. Um, for example, this is uh, really a kind of a weird picture. You have this uh, image of a, of, of a plant that's growing in the middle of a, well, an alley, it looks to me like, a little bit of dirt there. Um, but that plant is making it. Uh, ecotones, there's a transitional area 
between, well, the plant and the asphalt, I guess. Tr tr transitional areas of overlap between adjacent ecosystems. This is a little more like it, uh, where you have, uh, this is actually a, a bay trees and a, a lake, and you have uh, this area along in here is actually that ecotone, that transitional area. All ecosystem components are either biotic, those living parts, the trees in this case, or abiotic the non-living parts, and there's a tremendous amount of, of those. So, looking at those, well, first of all, let's look at ecotones. Seen this picture before, if you haven't, uh, you will. Well, you should have already seen it. Riparian zone of a river, this is a transition zone, right in there. It's an overlap between one ecosystem, the forest in this case, and the river in this case. So, that riparian zone is the ecotone of this particular river. Recall, or look ahead if you haven't done the assignment yet, which you can do, to that Kissimmee River Restoration Project. Again, the illustrations we had in the last chapter. All floodplains are ecotones. So let's look, we had biotic factors and abiotic factors. Well, classic abiotic factor. A roof is definitely an abiotic factor. In this case, we have plants growing in the gutter. Well, imagine that. So, abiotic factors, the roof, the, the air, the sun, all those things. Sunlight, temperature. Temperature is definitely an abiotic factor. It's not something that we control, but certainly organisms have to respond to it. Rainfall, there's no rainfall. These things aren't going to grow. Clearly, there's enough rainfall to sustain those particular plants growing in the gutter. Organisms, they are part of how they, they react to these abiotic factors. They survive only within the limits of their range of tolerance. And that range of tolerance changes depending upon the abiotic factor. Um, we're stationed here in Florida. Uh, our temperatures don't change that much, but a, an organism that, that can't tolerate large temperature changes isn't going to make it very well, say, in uh, uh, someplace up uh, north where it's very cold. That's just one example. They thrive only within the optimum range of temperatures, or rainfall or sunlight. Any element, rainfall, temperature, soil, nutrients, can be a limiting factor to growth, reproduction of key organisms in an ecosystem. All right, so the biotic factors, this is kind of a, uh, interesting. We have uh, uh, various things here that uh, happens that looks like a primrose willow, um, that's, there's uh, some, some torpedo grass in here. There's a bunch of different plant communities. There's a, actually a, a willow tree need to change pens, don't I? All of the things living in an ecosystem, population is a group of the same species in a given area. Put that in quotes. Let's see that again. Community is where you have several populations that are living together. For example, in this case, we have the, the willow trees here, and we have uh, some, some other sorts of organisms living in these various places. Torpedo grass is the other thing I'm trying to come up with. So, all these biotic factors are all, all along these interactions. We have where one organism will eat another one. It's called predation. We have organisms that will get along well. They're, they're commensal. They have to have each other. Mutualisms. Neutralisms. Parasitisms. Where one organism, for example, mistletoe. Mistletoe has to have a, a tree to live on, but it's a parasite on that tree. There's also a lot of competition, which is what we're showing here in this particular picture. Uh, between a lot of different plant types, but it's a lot of competition between species, interspecific inter species, interspecific and intraspecific competition. Any element can limit the growth of, or reproduction of a, a, a population. Biotic factors are very potent forces shaping the structure of these biological communities. Resilience is an important factor, important idea. When we looked at human systems, ecosystems experience fluctuation. We saw that with the lynx and the uh, uh, snowshoe hare. Sometimes it's temperature, sometimes it's rainfall, sometimes it's seasons. All these things, the abiotic factors, lead to these adaptations. And then the biotic factors, presence of food sources, predators, all those things lead to adaptations. But that snowshoe hare and the lynx, system goes through the ups and downs, but it still recovers. 
The ability of an ecosystem to recover from temporary changes or condi and conditions is considered to be resilience. Resilience is a very important concept uh, for ecosystem, ecosystem studies in particular. So, this is an idea of actually the term diversity. We won't get that much into this, this particular chapter. Maybe we will later. Diversity is composed of the number of species and their relative abundance. One form of diversity. So in this, uh, both these images, they have the same species. There are five, of, of five species in both of these images. But in this one here, I'm circling, all those trees are almost all the same. Most of them are made up of, uh, you know, one, one species is dominant, so the diversity is low. Draw the down, down arrow. This one has a much broader uh, representation. You see there's all kinds of different trees, almost all the same uh, abundance in that particular graphic. So diversity is much higher in that image. So that's just an idea. Higher diversity means that an ecosystem is probably going to be more resilient to change. Not always true. So here's a nice graphic. Species diversity and stability. Biodiversity, remember the term resilience. So, what are the components of biodiversity? It consists of, first of all, genetic diversity. Look at all these different shells down here. You can see that there's a tremendous variety of genetic material in these species or in a population of species. The variety of species and the genes that they contain in this particular image is a bunch of different bird species in this particular forest. Third component is changes, differences in ecosystems. These are three different ecosystems in a particular uh, portion of the world, deserts, uh, looks like forests and uh, uh, rainforests. And finally, functional diversity, the variety of processes, that's this graphic up here, uh, in the ecosystem that result from species interactions, whether that be photosynthesis or uh, consumption or, or, or uh, decomposition, whatever that function is, the more diversity there is in all four of those categories, those parts of biodiversity, uh, make an ecosystem resilient. If you have weakness in one of those, it's going to become re less resi resilient. And biodiversity, which we don't really have a number to, to quantify, we can't say it's, a, it, it's an eight, uh, that doesn't work. Um, biodiversity is really the measure of resi resilience of an ecosystem to disturbance. And then there's this idea of tipping points. Tipping points are, uh, well, okay, Easter Island. You remember Easter Island? Had this, these nice guys hanging up here. And in that article, we looked at uh, why, uh, why were the forests destroyed in Easter Island? One idea. Um, how was the behavior of the humans described? Ecocide, if you didn't remember that. Rats ate the forest. All these things led Easter Island to come to this tipping point where human beings were having to eat rats. That was what we ate. Not a great idea. But the, the island had reached a tipping point where the forest was no longer present, honestly. So, uh, graphic of uh, tipping points. <clears throat> Sometimes, uh, we don't know how long it takes for a system to respond to uh, perturbation. So uh, you have an ecosystem, it's on a tipping point, normally it's going along here just fine, but if you wait too long, it's going to end up falling off that tipping point. What does that mean? Well, those time delays vary, and the impact of time delays vary uh, depending upon the system. The time delays between the input a feedback stimulus and the response to it was going to be positive or negative. Environmental response, remember those positive feedback loops where you had that erosion in that uh, example of the Hubbard Brook uh, forest? Are we actually measuring the right things to capture tipping points? That's a very valid question. Uh, so tipping point is a threshold level, causes a shift in the behavior of a system. Past that tipping point, recovery to the original state is not certain. The system may be fundamentally different. Although the system may recover to some sort of a state, it may not be what it was before. Hmm. How do you restore those? Well, you may not be able to. This is an example from Glacier Bay in Alaska. George Vancouver, guy who they named the city after there in British Columbia, um, 1794 saw Glacier Bay. The shores of the continent formed two large open bays 
which were terminated by mountains of ice. Well, that's not how it looks today. Um, and John Muir, uh, less than 100 years later, found a very different place. He found a place that looks a lot more like this. Um, there were no glaciers present in the bay. The ice had retreated 30 to 40 kilometers up the valley. And this is without global warming. This is not, uh, well, it may have been global warming, but it wasn't human-induced because this was happening before we were having that much of an impact on things. When Muir and company camped on the barren land, they used fossil wood to make their fires. What were they using? They were using forests that had been frozen 10,000 years earlier. Basically, Muir and, and other uh, scientists, ecologists, realized that these trees had been here, then they'd gone away, and then they'd come back. So what caused those trees to come back? Succession. Gradual change in plant and animal communities in an area following a disturbance. Primary succession. Newly exposed geological substrates. Rock. No soil. That's a fundamental part of primary succession. Secondary succession. After a disturbance, for example, you have a forest that grows up, and you cut that forest down, and you grow uh, crops on the, on the resulting land, and then you allow that, that uh, uh, land to go back to forest. Well, you didn't destroy the soil, so secondary succession is where it does not destroy the soil. That's an important part. Climax community is something well, sometimes I refer to as the mythical climax community, but it is a late successional community that remains stable until disrupted by disturbance. I, I like to think of a... a, 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 a forest full of huge maple trees that is uh, climax with as, as good as it's going to get. Well, the truth of the matter is it's that all those trees aren't always going to be huge. You can't just, they're not static. The ecosystem is going to be changing. Uh, a better example is, is there's going to be trees falling over and small trees growing up, so there are many successions going on inside that, but it is a more stable, it's reached a homeostasis that environment has. So, primary succession looks like this. Start off with bare rock. There is nothing but bare rock. Right there. You're going to head yourself. There we go. Soil has to be formed. You break that rock down. Lichens and mosses are very good at that. Uh, then you have small herbs. Herbs. Where's that at? Right there. Uh, they move in. You get a heath mat forming. Then you have some small pine trees. Aspens start growing. You're moving through these cycles. You have fir, birch, and spruce community. That's what the climax. It takes thousands of years to go from bare rock all the way up to that mature community. Look at secondary succession. Uh, a little different. First of all, you start off with soil and weeds. You gotta have weeds. <laughs> what would we get out of weeds? Then you have perennial grasses. Those things populate. Shrubs and small pine seedlings come next. Then you have the young pine, oak, hickory, forest type coming in. And then this mature oak, hickory, forest. This is kind of a classic example. It's a great illustration. It takes less time. A hundred years or so, maybe less than that. And there are as many variations as there are ecosystems in this, of course. So, community change during succession. Uh, these guys, Reiners et al., studied changes in plant diversity during succession. Uh, the total number of plants increased, plant species increased, as the plot stage. This is 1941, if you can see that number or not. 1941, this part of it was full of ice. 2004, same spot. It's open water. That's how things have changed. So, over time, particularly over this, in this particular study site, over this 60 four-year, 63-year period, species richness increased, and then it de increased more slowly during later stages. Not all groups increased in density throughout the succession, so there's been quite a bit of study of this particular area. Look at the Galapagos Islands, which we haven't talked very much about, but we're going to talk some more about them, and this fellow named Thomas Malthus. Well, first of all, those are the Galapagos Islands, a nice image of them, volcanic islands uh, off the coast of Ecuador, uh, at the equator actually. And Thomas Malthus, first of all, Thomas Malthus, he was an Englishman, he was uh, a philosopher, a, a preacher, an economist, he did all kinds of things, uh, very, very well read and well written. He wrote an essay on the principle of populations, and in it he said, 
population, when unchecked, increases in a geometric ratio. Uh, that's an approximation. We know it increases in an exponential ratio, but that's different. Sub subsistence, as in farming, as in how fast we can develop our ag lands, increase only in an arithmetical ratio. He was concerned with the increasing populations in Europe and how are we going to feed these people. This is in 1798. What he postulated in a natural system is that natural environments act on organisms to make them better competitors. So, did he actually inspire some things in the future? I think he probably did. He drew an analogy to one society of humans outcompeting all the others. And he's drawing from this the writings of a guy named Ben Franklin and uh, the uh, brand new country that Ben was a part of, which of course we now know to be the United States. This British guy in 1798 is maybe a little bit uh, bitter. Yeah, maybe not. There are some sort of restrictive laws to nature that restrains organisms to their prescribed bounds to a certain extent. Man cannot by any effort of reason, escape it. In other words, we're going to have to figure out some way of feeding ourselves. Our population cannot grow forever exponentially, although it certainly has continued to grow since Malthus' time. All right. Biological evolution by selection. How life changes over time. It's not an idea foreign to those early Greek philosophers. Natural selection, articulated in 19th century independent life by Charles Darwin and Lord Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace. Organisms cons constantly struggle to meet their needs. Those with specific advantages over others are more likely to make it to survive. Survival traits become more prevalent in future generations through this idea of natural selection. Now there's Darwin. Son of an English physician. His family was very scientifically oriented, but he was well to do, so to speak. In 1835, Darwin visited the Galapagos. He became convinced that various populations evolved or changed from their ancestral forms by seeing different forms of, in this case, finches, is what he was looking at, on the Galapagos Islands. Darwin was very keen in his skills of observation, but he was lousy at math. So, there were things he could do, but things that he did really didn't get into. 1838, he's come back from his uh, tour on the Beagle to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, he read an essay by Malthus. He theorized some individuals would have a competitive advantage conferred by favorable characteristics. And this conferred comes to the term heritability. These characteristics have to be able to be inherited, passed down from one generation to the next. Enter this gentleman. That would be Gregor Mendel. He was a monk. St. Augustine was his, uh, I guess, patron? I don't know how that works. I'm not Catholic. Unlike Darwin, Mendel was trained in classical experimentation. He had a gift for numbers. He loved statistics. He studied the Garden Pea uh, quite extensively. Uh, discovered characteristics passed from parent to offspring in discrete packets called genes. He wasn't that many years after uh, Darwin had published The Origin of Species. Mendel was working in the 1860s, I think. These discrete packets remember the term heritability. And sort of spelled that way. Mendel gave us the way of, of looking at that. These genes exist in alternate forms called alleles. Some of these alleles prevent the expression of other alleles. We still use these same terms today, more than 100 years later. So, change the genetic makeup of a population. Populations. Not individuals evolve by becoming genetically different. A story this uh, afternoon about a uh, uh, bacterial populations that change. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Though. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. First step in evolution is development of genetic variability. Now, how do we do that? Mutations, random changes in the structure of DNA. We talked about DNA. DNA is kind of the, the fundamental uh, building block, if you will. It tells our our cells what to do. But DNA is always mutating. In some organisms, like bacteria, DNA, it, DNA mutates more rapidly than in other organisms, such as ourselves. So a mutation is a random change in a cell that can be inherited. Heritability, again, there's that word, by offspring. So, natural selection acts on individuals. But the second step in evolution, successful adaptations lead to differential reproduction. In other words, some of these organisms 
because they inherited certain traits, are more successful at getting their genes to the next generation. Oh, the word I was going to write up here is fit, fitness. That doesn't mean going to the gym. It means your ability, the ability to get genes into the next generation. The advantages, advantage, advantages, that's advantages gained, golly bum, I need to read this more carefully, gained through inheritable traits, natural selection for individuals, better suited to survive in particular environmental conditions. Genetic resistance. This is kind of what I was getting at in my story earlier. The ability of organisms to tolerate chemicals designed to kill them. Well, given equal exposure to chemicals, most of the organisms are killed. In the case of uh, antibiotic, antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, they, uh, uh, most of the ones, most of the, the bacteria are killed by the antibiotics. Well, but what those that were not killed had an adaptation that somehow makes them immune to that uh, chemical, makes it harmless. So they're the ones who survive, the others die. That is a part of uh, that uh, differential reproduction. When environmental conditions change, there are very few options for a population, uh, a certain set of species. They can either adapt to that environmental change, which is possible, but not always something's going to happen. They can migrate. They can move to another place where environmental conditions are more favorable. Or, if they stay in place and they are not adapted to those environmental changes, they become extinct. It's not usually an option that we choose. So, looking at natural selection. Begat organisms begat like organisms. Chance, there is a chance variation between individuals. Some of these variations are heritable. There's that word. Spelled properly, by the way. Passed on to the offspring. More offspring are, are produced each generation than can survive. The excess don't survive. Some individuals, because of physical or behavioral traits, have a higher chance of making it than others in that same population. So, speciation. In this case, it's through isolation. We had the example of speciation likely through uh, uh, resistance to a certain uh, chemical input, but this is, we're going to look at just at isolation. So, this is a, a classic example. You have a, a, po a population of foxes uh, being introduced into North America, and then one population goes north, one population goes south. What happens? So under the right circumstances, natural selection leads to new species, two of several mechanisms. First of all, is this geographic isolation, where you have one population going south, one population going north, different groups, same population, same species, become isolated from one another for long periods of time by this physical barrier. Mountains, volcanoes, it's moving apart. Um, even roads can provide that geographic isolation. So, moving along past geographic isolation, then you have what this leads to, reproductive isolation. Two separate species, eventually. Mutation and natural selection operate independently because the arctic fox is not being exposed to the same sort of environment that that gray fox is being exposed to. They are being uh, differently acted on by the environment. The gene pools are isolating these populations. Over long periods of time, that genetic change prevents viable offspring between these two now different species. You have different environmental conditions that lead to different pressures on these species, and you have the evolution of the two different species. This is the whole picture. The Arctic fox adapted to cold, that's well, heavier fur, short ears, short legs, short nose, well that's short. That's okay, it's adapted well. It's also well camouflaged. That's this dude that lives up here. And you look at the gray fox. Adapted to heat, lightweight fur, uh, long ears, long eared and galoot, well maybe not. And nose gives off more heat. So they're much more adapted to that environment. The idea of extinction. Extinction is forever. This is a threatened, highly threatened uh, tree frog. Demic species are found in only one area. Those species are particularly susceptible to extinction. If they're only found in one place, 
uh, and something happens in that one place, then it's likely that uh, they're not going to be able to adapt and move somewhere else. They primarily exist, these endemic species that exist on things called islands. And you think about an island, okay, yeah, I know what an island is, like the Galapagos or like Hawaii. Well, any physically isolated patch of habitat can be an island, a habitat island. Where we are here in central Florida, these ridges are considered to be habitat islands. Kind of hard to uh, believe, but we are surrounded by land that's uh, very different, habitats very different than what we have here in uh, scrub portions of Central Florida. Mass extinctions occur when there's a drastic change in environmental conditions. They cause 20 to 95 percent of the, all the species to go extinct. This has happened between three and five times in the last 500 million years. There's some scientists who think we are heading towards a sixth mass extinction. Um, more on that later. Background extinction is going on all the time. It's estimated that between one and five species uh, is going extinct for every million species on the Earth. So that's not very fast. Speciation is also happening at the same rate. So you have extinction being balanced by speciation in the absence of when you have mass extinctions. So, predation. Oh, that's a big predator. Most consumers, including us, we feed on live organisms of other species. Well, we don't, we cook ours first. Predators may be captured, may capture prey by walking. Okay, this guy didn't just walk up to it. Swimming, I think he swam to it. Flying. Pursuit and ambush. A combination of swimming and pursuit and ambush is how he got that trout. Um, camouflage, not for the bear, but other organisms do use camouflage to capture prey. Uh, chemical warfare. Quite often, uh, snakes will use that to capture their prey. And there's uh, this idea of how prey avoid capture. Well, camouflage. Kind of same idea. This looks like a stick. It's actually a, a worm. And this bug here, actually, that's a bug. It looks like a tree leaf. Hmm. Camouflage. You can also have chemical warfare. This is a bombardier beetle. <laughs> it shoots acid out of, uh, out of its snout. Definitely want to mess with that. And this is the monarch butterfly, and its chemical warfare, I guess, is that it makes birds sick. It, is, it tastes so bad. It, it makes them taste sick. It makes them sick, so they avoid the species. You have some, some species that are uh, using warning coloration to keep uh, uh, the predators away. Others use mimicry. This is actually, I think, the viceroy butterfly here. It looks a lot like the monarch butterfly, and, and uh, honestly, if I were a bird flying by, I probably wouldn't take the chance to get the wrong one. Deceptive looks. This moth has these huge eyes uh, on it. Uh, they aren't really eyes. Those are actually just spots in the wings. And then you also have, this is actually a caterpillar with what looks like a snake's head, uh, and that's just an adaptation. And that's deceptive behavior is the same way. So, let's look at some how predator and prey drive each other's evolution. There's intense, nat intense natural selection pressures between predators and prey populations. So let's look at bats and moth. They come flying in there. There's a moth trying to get away from the bat, and the bat says, I got you in my sights. Well, what's really going on here? In order to survive, obviously moths have adapted because moths still survive and so do bats. Moths have developed a variety of defense mechanisms that bats, through natural selection, sometimes they can overcome them, sometimes they can't. But there's this back and forth continuous competition, well, I guess it's competition if you win, uh, between the bats and the moths. So bats and moths again. Uh, it's not a process where one species designs these tactics to with the other. It's a population level change. Those bats that get more moths survive better at differential reproduction. And they are able to then pass whatever that genetic change is onto the next generation. The same way with moths. If the moth doesn't get eaten, whatever technique it used to escape that bat is going to get passed on to the next generation. So those changes are expressed in successful individuals. Coevolution is the idea. A process where two species, through natural selection, adapt through competition to one another, and they thrive, although they're always in competition. So what are some adaptations that made us so successful? You could probably imagine that uh, uh, the iPhone, that's one of them. <laughs> no, not really. I'm kidding. Opposable thumbs. 
which you couldn't use the iPhone without. There you go. Um, walking upright, a very important adaptation. It's made us very successful. Our large brain, which allows us to put together PowerPoints and talk about them, among other things. And then speech. All of these things allows us to communicate, walk upright, handle tools. Those adaptations have made us extremely successful. And other species may have larger brains, but they don't have the other things. Um, speech in particular, uh, communication is a big part of it. Walking upright and opposable thumbs are very important as well. So, we are one of the most fierce competitors in the natural environment. For example, we compete through these non-living, these abiotic factors. Chemically, we release nutrients in excess. That's competition, believe it or not, when we're trying to actually farm the land. Uh, we introduce synthetic compounds in large amounts to the uh, environment. Physically, uh, we burn fossil fuels, greatly increasing the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, are we actually intending to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, or are we just trying to get from one place to another? Hmm. We, we release, and we'll talk more about these things, CFCs, that's shorthand for chlorofluorocarbons, I don't even try to spell that stuff out, but CFCs are used, were used extensively from the 1930s until the 1980s or 90s uh, as refrigerants. We like to have things cool. Well, CFCs uh, were beneficial to us, but they weren't so beneficial to certain parts of the environment. We'll talk about that in a later lecture. Power plant, water discharge. In the wintertime, uh, quite often, we, we, like to have, uh, we like to have our electricity, and power plants have to have cooling water. Well, in the winter, uh, animals that uh, don't like cold water, for example, let's say manatees, uh, they will go hang out in the discharge water from power plants, uh, which is a positive thing for them because of habitat destruction, but in other parts of the country it does cause some problems for species. How about sinkholes? Uh, this is one that's one of those news articles that uh, uh, you will, will have as a discussion forum at, uh, in a later lecture, but this is a sinkhole, actually, in the bottom of a phosphate uh, storage pond uh, in a, a little town called Mulberry, Florida. And uh, starting uh, in uh, over about a two-week period, uh, 217 million gallons of phosphorus-laden waste that has some other nasty stuff in it leaked out of the bottom of, of this particular pond and into the groundwater. Um, the groundwater throughout Central Florida. It'll be interesting to see how we follow up on this one. We are one of the fiercest competitors in the natural environment in the biotic environment, biotic areas too. We destroy a lot of habitat. We love to use bulldozers, we love to tear things up. Well, for the, our purposes it are to uh, increase where we live, increase those sorts of things. Build cities, build roads, uh, agriculture, another big part of we have to feed ourselves, so we do a lot of habitat rearranging to put in farms. We've introduced a lot of species. Beneficial to us, at least to us, now there's, I had other beneficial examples uh, on the previous slide. Sometimes it's accidental, the zebra mussel. Zebra mussel was actually introduced into the Great Lakes, and zebra mussels are Tremendously difficult to uh, get rid of. They love to, they, they, they grow, outgrow everything else, at least in North America, because there is no uh, natural predators. But zebra mussels uh, were common in, in Asia, uh, I think in China, and uh, ships would uh, come in, and uh, one of the things that, that ships have to do, it's a matter of routine, is they t take on ballast water. They suck up water out of the bay where they are. Well, they sucked up the zebra mussels out of this bay in China, and then they made their way around to uh, the, the Great Lakes. And then they, because they were going to take on a load, they had to discharge that ballast water so they could hold that extra uh, material. And the zebra mussels were introduced in the Great Lakes that way, and they've made tremendous, done tremendous harm there. Predator elimination. We love to get rid. We don't. We like. We like being the top predator. So we have gotten rid of wolves. There's a whole lecture on wolves and how important they are to the ecosystem. Bears. We have greatly impacted bears because they are big and, and scary and, and they like to eat our garbage, but they're also uh, a threat to us, but they, wolves and bears control certain aspects of the environment. For example, all those uh, uh, snowshoe hares, they have to be, something has to keep culling them. Well, panthers are really good at that. 
Uh, we, we certainly have cut off panthers uh, from a lot of the prey that they used to eat. There's a kind of a, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but uh, panthers are pretty much restricted to an area south of uh, the Alligator Alley, the I-75 corridor that runs between Naples and Miami. And s throughout peninsular Florida, uh, wild hogs, feral hogs, are a real problem. Panthers have pretty much taken care of that problem south of the, the uh, Alligator Alley um, because they like hogs. Well, they, they prey on a lot of different things. But that, if that's supporting the panther population, that's great. Let me use a panther around here. Pathogens, one of those other things that we have introduced. Ebola virus is one of those things that we have could see spreading, certainly in the news uh, in previous years. Chestnut fungus, that's another one that is a, uh, and that's not a, a picture of a chestnut fungus, that's a picture of a, a mosquito. But we introduced that pathogen, it's taken out chestnut trees. And then we also have this, this is the uh, Aedes aegypti, you may or may not have heard of it, causes... Uh, it doesn't cause it, it carries a Zika virus. Now, did I already have that on a bullet? No, I did not. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll talk more about, actually, that's for this particular unit. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Uh, Zika and the Aedes aegypti mosquito, its control, is a part of the discussion forum for this particular unit, Unit 2. Himalayas, this is a future assignment. We'll talk about black carbon and its impacts on the system. And... This is an image of actually the, the amount of the change in snowpack over time in the Himalayas. A lot of that is due to the uh, increasing amount of burning of wood, if you will, that's what black carbon is, and how it could be actually uh, reversed, uh, the loss of, of uh, these uh, uh, Himalayan glaciers. So, Himalayas reach a tipping point. Have they reached a tip tipping point? Uh, it takes a long time to see some of those changes. Well, between the input of the feedback and the response to it takes a while. Remember positive and negative feedback loops. Well, this is an image of actually uh, the, uh, some glaciers in the Himalayas. Uh, 2000, 1974, uh, this is all uh, snow and ice. The same image, same area uh, in 2007 is devoid of snow and ice. Uh, this is uh, from a, uh, uh, an ongoing research project. Have the Himalayas reached this tipping point? Have they reached this threshold level? Uh, it causes that system to shift uh, away from snow and ice down to no snow and ice. Past the tipping point, can we get that back up the hill and, and make snow and ice happen again in the Himalayas? I don't know. Do we want to do that? Well, uh, more snow mount, no, more snowpack, snowpack uh, uh, glaciers uh, support a lot of the rivers that feed a lot of the, provide a lot of the water uh, to the Asian subcontinent, the Indian subcontinent, um, might be important. All right, summary of this lecture. Talk about homeostasis, maintaining a balance, human homeostasis, and environmental homeostasis. And talking about biodiversity, balance in natural systems, what controls populations? That snowshoe hare and the lynx. Resilience, very important. More resilient ecosystems, the better they're going to support their biodiversity. Species diversity and stability. Talked a little bit about that. So natural succession, how life is established in terrestrial systems. You have primary succession from rock, and then you have rock, that's a K, there we go. And secondary succession, which starts off with soil. You have to have a soil basis for that. Change during succession. We talked about how you go, takes, in primary succession, it may take thousands of years to go from bare rock to a mature climax forest. Secondary succession may only take 100 years to go from this soil on to a, a mature forest. Evolution, source of the Earth's biodiversity and responding to changing conditions. Talked about natural selection, how it acts on populations, not individuals. Genetic variation happens at the individual level. Genetic variation is happening all the time. Talk about how speciation happens. In this case, we actually used the idea of uh, the, uh, the foxes uh, speciating, differentiating into the Arctic fox 
and uh, the, the, the common uh, brown fox. Coevolution, we use the bat and its uh, prey, moths. Human impacts on ecosystems in the biotic and the abiotic environment. And these are the references for lecture number seven. I'll leave you to look. There's quite a few. We kind of have a, a lot of a lot more information in there. Um, one of these, where's the one that is, uh, uh, there we go, Fosu, Parafosa Glaciers. That's really cool. That's a, that's a really neat one. So, uh, Recall that after you have viewed this lecture, you will have access to the uh, lecture seven quiz, and then you will have be able to access, uh, after you've taken that quiz, you will be able to access the unit two test. Please refer to the syllabus for the due dates for all of these assignments.